So, so Francesca, you have some time constraint on your side, right? Oh, it's in two hours, so. Oh, okay. Like, we're not gonna go to that one. Yeah. <laughs> means I really I was just that wondering, like, if it's just like <laughs> one hour later, then we we have to be really on time. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's at eleven twenty-five, so two hour and a half. So, no, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> so, I mean, typically we start maybe one or two or three minutes late. Yeah, that's good. So we let people that's in. Why. So, so are you ready? Like, um, so shall we get it started? Yeah, I think that's fine by me. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so let's get it started now then. So, uh, hi everyone. So, uh, welcome back to the Degas Webinar Seminar Series. So this is our second seminar for the, for the year 2023. So today it is our pleasure to have invited Professor Francesca Parisa. Uh, to give us a talk at uh, this webinar se series. So Francesca is an assistant professor at the School of ECE at the Cornell University. And before that, she, she, before then she, has, uh, she was a postdoc at the Leeds at MIT, and she defined her PhD at ETH Zurich at the Automatic, at the automatic Control Laboratories, and she received her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Padova in Italy. And when she actually simultaneously attained the, the Galilean School of Excellence, so which is, uh, I think it's like some kind of an elite school. So uh, her interest, her research interest is on the identifications, analysis, and control of multi-agent systems with applications to uh, transportation, energy, social and energy, and economics networks. So which I think is aligns very well with a lot of the audiences here. So she has been recognized as an EECS uh, rising star in 2017, and also recipients of a number of awards from Switzerland and Italy. And she also received an ETH medal for her doctoral work. And so today she will share with us her, some of her works on recent works on tractable network interventions from large social technical systems. So uh, I've, that's a very exciting topic. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to this seminar series. Um, so as mentioned today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my work on a kind of network intervention for sociotechnical systems. Um, and to begin with, let me just say what do I mean by a sociotechnical system? So by that, I mean a system where we have large number of nodes or agents that are interacting in some heterogeneous way. And this type of interaction typically are guided through either some physical network infrastructure, um, as you can see here on the left, maybe a traffic network or a power network, or this could also be more virtual type of interaction when we think about connection in social network or maybe economic networks. And now it's clear that, you know, in all these type of settings, if we want to intervene on the system, maybe to improve performance or resilience, we should actually try to exploit this type of network information and network interaction. Um, now, what is the challenge with that is that um, the size of modern sociotechnical system is constantly increasing, and this introduces a number of difficulties. So, for example, the fact that this system may be of very large dimension means that we have problems of computational tractability. Um, interaction among these agents may also be time varying, which means that if we look at this from a perspective of a central planner, there may be uncertainty on exactly what is the actual underlying network. And finally, in many of these examples that I'm gonna talk about, uh, the nodes are actually people that typically make decisions and they are somehow strategic. So we have to capture also this type of strategic behavior. 
And so in my research, I tried to analyze this type of challenges using a combination of tools that spans, you know, from network theory to describe the underlying interaction, game theory to understand this type of strategic behavior, and then control and optimization, if we think of it from the perspective of a planner that wants to optimize this system. And so uh, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about two projects that I've worked on in this general area. So one is going to be more in the socioeconomic context. Um, and so we're going to talk about contagion processes in that case. And then in the second part, this is going to be very brief at the end, I'm going to also mention something where the network of interaction is a physical network, in that case, the power grid. Okay, um, so having said that, let me go to the first part. So this is work about graph on contagion, and this is something I've done with Salman Errol from CMU and Alex Tettelboim from Oxford University. And just kind of as a motivation for contagion um, over networks, you can think about many social and economic settings where you have that individuals make decisions, but they don't do this in isolation. They are affected by the decision of their friends, colleagues, peers, and competitors. And so to be a little bit more concrete, you can think about, for example, adoption of a certain innovation that maybe start with an initial uh, set of adopters that then will spread these um, and communicate it to more of their friends and so on, so that this process will spread. Uh, but the same can also be observed if we think about economic networks, maybe in cascading failures when we have uh, maybe a bank that um, fails and because of that other banks that had loans and that were connected to this initial bank will also be in distress. And so again, we have a process that may propagate. And so really in all this setting, what we end up having is that agents are affected or influenced by the decision action of their peers, and these may give rise to this cascading behavior type of phenomena. And now in the literature, there's actually two different uh, models or two different uh, framework to think about this cascading behavior. Um, based on whether the contagion is simple in the sense that it's enough for maybe, you know, one of my friends or one of my neighbors to adopt this or have this behavior for me to actually adopt as well. Um, and this, I mean, you can think of it in the simplest case in epidemic, for example, if you think about an epidemic spreading through a network, if one of my neighbors is infected, there is some chance that I will get it and having just one neighbor, it's enough for that. Um, on the other hand, if you think about maybe, you know, technology adoption um, or even bank failure, maybe that's more in the complex contagion regime because I need more than one of my neighbors in order for me to have an incentive to kind of adopt these or to cause problems to uh, my system. And so in, in, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this complex uh, network contagion phenomena. So we're going to need more than one neighbors in order for this process to spread. Um, and uh, maybe the most common model uh, of complex contagion is that of linear threshold contagion, which is the one we're going to use today. So to be a little bit more precise, what we have here, we have a population with N agents that are interacting over a network. And these agents may be heterogeneous in the sense that every agent may have a different threshold tau i of when is that I adopt with respect to what my neighbors are doing. And so specifically, we're going to say that an agent adopt if more than tau i fraction of his neighbor have already adopted. And now you see that the interesting part of this is to look at the dynamics. So we're going to consider an evolution over time. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to start with an initial set of adopter. These are sometimes called the seed set, which is this C0n, which is going to represent of my population who are the first one that adopted. And then the interesting thing is see how this process spreads over time. And in particular, if I want to see a time t, agent I will adopt at that time t if um, the number of neighbors of agent I that adopted at t minus one over the total number of neighbors is greater than this heterogeneous threshold. Um, and as I mentioned, this leads to the so-called linear threshold model uh, that was introduced in graph vector and it's kind of been one of the core models that people have studied for understanding contagion and in fact one important question that people ask in this setting is how do you say that we have some uh, like a power on choosing the initial set of adopters how should we choose this set in order to maximize the outcome of contagion so think of it in the product adoption case I want to ask myself maybe I can give my product for free to some people 
to who should I give this product to such that then when they talk to their friends and so on, my product will be adopted by uh, the most people possible. And this is actually a very classic question. There's a beautiful uh, seminal paper that uh, poses and partially solved this question in the case of uh, Kempe, Climbers and Tardos in 2003 where they look at for when the threshold are sample at random, they show that a greedy heuristic is almost optimal to solve this problem. Uh, but one issue that I want to uh, raise of these type of methods is that in order to do that, the planner needs to have full network knowledge. And so this really brings me to the challenge that I want to address today, which is the fact that when we consider large networks, two problems may emerge. So on the one end, collecting exact network information becomes extremely costly. Um, and on the other end, even if we had this exact network information, planning optimal intervention may become really uh, hard or intractable. And so really the question that I want to address today is, can we still aim at maximizing adoption if we are in these large network regimes for which we don't have exact network information? And really the kind of core idea of how we're gonna do that um, is to uh, go from a deterministic approach where we relied on exact network information to a stochastic approach, whereby what I'm gonna assume is that we now have a stochastic network formation model, and we are gonna assume that the network that we see um, in real life is just one possible realization of this stochastic network formation model. And the key question that I want to address is, what can a planner do if it doesn't have information about the realized network, if it only has information about the way in which this network is generated. Um, and before moving on, I have to say that this idea of kind of gaining tractability and requiring less information by going from a deterministic to a stochastic approach is something that's been successfully used in the literature before. Um, for example, there's um, application of that in opinion dynamics, uh, in network games, and then if we look at the contagion process part, this has been applied in simple contagion models. So kind of independent cascade, like uh, the one I've discussed at the beginning where you just need one node um, to, uh, for the process to spread. Uh, but it's also been discussed in linear threshold model as the one that I just detailed over specific uh, uh, stochastic network formation model like SVM, stochastic block model um, or configuration model. So really what I'm gonna do today instead is looking at this linear threshold model dynamics over a general uh, stochastic network formation model, which is encoded by a graphon. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, let me first kind of specify what is a graphon and how is that related to stochastic network formation processes. Um, so mathematically, a graphon is just a symmetric measurable function W that uh, maps the zero one square interval into zero one. And there's actually two ways in which you can um, see connection between this object and graph theory. So the first one is in terms of limit of a graph. So the idea is that you can obtain a graph on just by uh, taking a network, a finite network and letting the size of this network grow such that you see at the limit, you're gonna have an infinite number of agents that you can map into the zero one interval. And really the idea is that the WUV is gonna tell you what is the interaction between two infinitesimal agents, one in position U and one in position V. So this is kind of a generalization of an adjacency matrix of a finite network when we go to infinite population. On the other hand, there's also a second interpretation of um, graphons uh, in terms of random graph model. And this is how we're gonna use graphon to encode a stochastic network formation process. And so the idea is that basically you can use a graphon to describe a probability distribution in the space of graphs so that you can create a graph of any desired size from the graphon model. And the way you do this is actually quite simple. So say you want to create a graph with five nodes. What you're gonna do first is assign to each one of these nodes a label UI that is uniformly sample at random in zero one. And then what you do is you connect every pair of agents um, UI, UJ with probability Bernoulli, probability W evaluated at UI, UJ, the corresponding labels. And you see this is kind of a powerful way to generate random graph because we recover a special cases, for example, erdos rainy model, where every agent is connected with the same probability. Um, that would be uh, just a constant graphon. 
Uh, but we can also recover stochastic block model, for example, because um, in that case, we just have the, we partition the agents into a number of communities and then we connect them with probability that depends only on the community that can also be obtained by with a graph on that is now piecewise constant. So really what I'm gonna try to do today is um, basically looking back at our question and say, what can I say about the processes of a contagion process evolving over a realized network if I only have information about the stochastic network formation model, which in our case, we're gonna encode with this graph on object. So really my question now becomes, can I regulate contagion over network that are sample from this graph on model? And in order to answer this question, I'm gonna use a three-step approach. So um, the first step, remember, we are interested here in large population. So what we're gonna do first is take the limit for infinite population and try to define a contagion process for an infinite population that's interacting over this graph on model. And so that is gonna give me some prediction of how adoption evolves over time. Now, of course, this is what happens for the infinite population. What I'm interested in is what happened in the realized network. So the second step is gonna to be to try to convince you that this um, adoption profile that we see for the infinite population is a good prediction of what behavior in any of the sample network, as long as I have large enough population. And then finally, based on this, I'm gonna uh, give you some uh, new perspective of how can we design optimal seeding policies when we only have information about the graph and we are not allowed to see the realized network. Okay, so having said that, let me go to the first step. Again, here I'm like kind of looking at the infinite population and I, my objective is to define, first of all, kind of a linear threshold model equivalent for that and see um, how can I study that type of uh, infinite population system. Um, and the way we're gonna do this is quite easy. So um, since we are in an infinite population, now we are gonna have a continuum of agents. And so these I'm gonna map into the zero one interval. Now, remember in the finite case, every the agent has an heterogeneous threshold. So in order to kind of copy that for the infinite population, what I'm gonna have now is a threshold function, right? This is a function that tells me for every agent in my zero one interval, what is its individual threshold. And then finally, uh, I need to define what is the set of initial adopters. And so this is what I call here C0. And what we're gonna assume is that this is just a measurable subset of the available players, which in this case is the interval zero one. And now exactly as in the finite case, the interesting thing is to see how this evolves over time. So I'm gonna call the set of adopters at time T CT, and I'm gonna define some dynamics whereby my agent U, which is now kind of labeled in the zero one interval, is gonna adopt at time T exactly as before if uh, U's neighbor that adopted at time T minus one over the total number of neighbors is greater than its individual threshold. Now, the only thing that is slightly tricky is how do I compute these numbers of neighbors uh, when I have the infinite population? And uh, it turns out that the way you do this is by taking an integral. Let's see, for example, if I want to know what is kind of the degree of agent U, so the total number of neighbors of agent U, that is just going to be an integral over all my population of the weight that U assigns to each one of the other nodes B um, integrated over V. Right, so this is kind of the equivalent of in the finite population taking a sum of my neighbors. And then if I wanna know of these, how many are the ones that actually adopted that time T minus one, I'm gonna have exactly the same quantity, but I'm now gonna count agent B only if it belongs to the set C T minus one, right? So this is an indicator function that is gonna be equal to one only when V belongs to the set of adopter at the previous time. Okay, so this is kind of define, is gonna define how the process spreads. Um, and just to make sure everybody is on the same page, let me go through a very simple example, which we can obtain when we make the graph on constant um, and constantly equal to P. And also for simplicity, we're gonna also take the uh, threshold function to be a constant function. And so this is gonna give rise to an erdos renyi model where basically every agent is homogeneous, they all have the same threshold. And if we look at the formula that we need to compute in order to understand whether um, agents will adopt or not, we see that that simplifies because the W is always equal to P, right? So this will actually factor out and in fact cancels out. So really the only thing that matters is gonna be the integral of the set of previous adopter, which really is just the mass of adopter that I have at time T minus one. 
So really we see here that we have a very sharp prediction. If the mass of adopter at T minus one is greater than the threshold, then I will adopt. If not, I will not adopt. And note that this is a condition that now does not depend on the label of the agents anymore because agents in this very simple model are homogeneous. So everybody will behave the same. So overall, we have a very sharp prediction of what's going to happen. If the measure of my seed set is less or equal than the threshold, then there is no further contagion, right? The process will stop. If instead the measure is greater than the threshold, then all agents will end up adopting. Um, and so this is an illustration of this process. We see the fraction of final adopters as a function of the seed size. And you see up to the threshold, which in this case is 0 0.3, nothing happens. The fraction of final adopters is equal to the seed size. And then after that, we have this sharp transition where everybody adopts. So this is, of course, a very simple example, but I think it already gives you some intuition that when you go to the limit, things may actually simplify and maybe more tractable to explain and to understand than instead in the realized network. Like remember in this case, the realized network would be an erdos schrenny model where now I may have link or not. So that would be much harder to analyze what happened uh, instead, if I take the limit, this becomes a very simple process. Now, of course, the question that you can ask then is, well, is this process for the infinite population in any way predictive of what happened for the final population? I understand that I can kind of um, analyze what happens there, but is that going to give me something about the original process? And so that's kind of the second step of this approach, which is this type of convergence uh, behavior that we want to try to prove. Um, and so in order to do that, I need to first specify a little bit more what do I mean contagion over a sample network. Um, and so what we're going to do in this case is consider a finite number of agents. And remember the way in which we sample network from a graphon is to associate to each one of the nodes a label UI. So each one of my agents in the sample network will have a label UI of n, which is just a number in 0, 1. Now, our, our interaction in the sample network, this is according to the network that I sampled from the graphon. So I'm going to put Bernoulli link with probability UI UJ um, for each pair of nodes. Um, and then what I think it's interesting is how do we define basically the seed set? Um, and remember that each agent has an, all, a label to begin with. So in order to kind of derive a finite process that has some relation to what we have for the infinite case, what we're going to say is that the set of adopter in this case is going to be the set of agents I for which the corresponding label, which I have assigned to them, belongs to the initial set for the infinite population model. Right? This label is the number in 0, 1. C0 was a subset of 0, 1. So I just need to check is my label belonging to the seed set of the infinite population, then I'm going to be an adopter even in the finite network. And then similarly, we can define the threshold. So in this case, um, the threshold of node i is going to be inherited from the threshold function that we defined before, simply by evaluating these at the corresponding label of agent i in the sample network. And now I've set up all that I needed to do, right? Because now I have you know, my initial seed set, I have my threshold. I can simply run a linear threshold model exactly as we discussed at the very beginning of this talk for finite networks. So this process here is exactly the same that you've seen before, um, given how we initialize the seed set and the threshold of the agents. OK, and so this is now allows me to present the main result of this work, um, which kind of in a nutshell says that if we have um, some regularity condition and a large enough network, then we can actually predict with high probability what will happen in the sample network just by looking at what happened in the infinite population model. And in particular, you know, if you call C infinity, the set of final adopters in the infinite population model, what we're going to be able to say is that every agent in the sample network whose label belongs to the set will adopt with high probability and every agent whose label ends up not being in the set, so this would be not adopters in the infinite population model, will also not adopt with high probability in the sample network. Now, why do I say that this is informal? Because you see that there are some actually question marks for some of the nodes. And so these I need to specify a little bit better 
uh, what happens. There's going to be some borderline cases for which we are not able to say anything. But the um, gist of the thing is that for the majority of the nodes, we're going to be able to predict their behavior uh, from uh, what happened in the infinite population model. OK, so with that, let me go uh, to the main theoretical result, a little bit more technical, and I'm going to divide these in two parts. So first, we're going to focus on what happens to the adopters, and then we're going to focus on what happens to the non-adopters. So uh, in order to understand what happens to the adopter, remember C infinity is the terminal set of adopters in the graphon model. So for the infinite population, I can similarly define a C infinity N as the terminal set of adopter in the sample network. And I kind of want to understand what is the relation between these two objects. And so formally, what our theorem says is that uh, for any precision epsilon and for any tolerance kappa, there's going to be a N large enough such that if I have a population that is larger than that threshold of n, then with very high probability, what I can say is that every agent i in my sample network whose label belongs to a set C epsilon infinity, which is a subset of C infinity, is going to adopt. And the good news here is that I can make this set C epsilon infinity be as close as I want to the original set C infinity because the difference in measure of these two is going to be at, at most epsilon. So basically what this is saying is that I cannot really qualify what happens for all my set of C infinity, but I can always find for any tolerance a subset that is close epsilon close to the original one. And for all of these, if my label belongs to that set, then with a high probability, the agency is going to adopt. OK, so uh, let me go slightly to the proof intuition so that you will understand why I need to kind of remove this epsilon measure. Um, and uh, in order to do that, the way we make this proof is actually by induction over time. So what we're going to prove is that, you know, the set of adopters at time t can be well approximated with the infinite population model. Therefore, the set at t plus one will be well approximated and so on and so forth. And then kind of we're going to have the limit uh, for the C infinity. So just to give you an, a kind of an idea of the proof, let me focus on one time step um, and let me prove the result for that time step. And so the idea here, what do I need to prove? Well, I need to prove that if I have an agent I in my sample network whose label belongs to the set of adopters for the infinite population, then with high probability that agent will also adopt. So what is the condition for that agent adopting in the sample network? Well, that condition, if you remember, was the number of agents that adopted over total number of agents should be greater than the threshold. So that condition is can be rewritten in this magenta quantity here, where this is the threshold, this is shorthand for total number of neighbors, and this is shorthand for total number of neighbors that adopted. So you can convince this, this is exactly the same condition that I had before. Okay, so what I would like is the, for this condition to be positive. Um, and now, what is the key idea of the proof? Well, the key idea is to note that the total number of neighbors and the total number of neighbors that are adopted are actually sum of random variables, where each one of these random variables is actually kind of a Bernoulli that depends on how we generated the network. So by building on this intuition, we can show that using concentration inequality, these quantities here for the sample network will converge when n goes to infinity to the corresponding quantity for the infinite population model. And so what that means is that this magenta quantity that we wanted to study is kind of converging to the same quantity for the infinite population model, which is this blue quantity here. But now remember, we started with a label that belongs to the set of adopter in the infinite population model. So we know that E will satisfy this condition for the infinite population model. So we know that this quantity here um, is now going to be positive. So what we have is now we have something that we don't know is sign, but this something is converging to something positive. And in fact, by removing an epsilon measure from my set, I can guarantee that this blue quantity is actually bounded away from zero. And that will guarantee that this magenta quantity for n large enough is also going to become positive because it's converging to something that's strictly positive. And so that's how we kind of reproduce this result for the set of adopters. Now, the other side of the uh, question is what happens to the set of non-adopters? 
Um, and we would kind of like, you know, to do exactly the same technique. Um, so call the infinity, the set of known adopters, the infinity and the set of known adopters in the sample network and kind of redo the same arguments. Now, the only problem with that is that remember when we have a condition for who adopts, we have a strict inequality. So an agent adopts if that condition that we discuss is greater than the threshold. So an agent will not adopt if that is less or equal than the threshold. So this will give me a less or equal than zero once we rewrite the condition like this. And this is a problem for the type of proof that we've done before, because if this condition is exactly zero and I have something converging to zero, I will never be able to tell whether this is positive or negative. I need it to be strictly negative for something converging to it to be able to say that it's negative. And that's why we have to kind of refine this result and look for a set d bar infinity, which is a subset of our original known adopters where this condition is strict. And then for that set d bar infinity, we can actually make exactly the same proof as before and find a subset that is epsilon close for which we can predict what will happen to the agents in the sample network. So that's kind of the other side of the um, coin. Now, of course, you will realize that here I've not qualified what happens to all my agents, right? There is still this set, d infinity minus d bar infinity, which would be kind of the set for which I have strict equality. Um, that I cannot pin down. Like just knowing what happens to this agent in the infinite model is not enough to tell me what happens in the sample network. Now, the good news is that the measure of how many agents I have in the set is something that you can compute once you kind of solve for the infinite population model, right? That only depends on the infinite population model, does not depend on the realized network. And in fact, in many cases, this would actually be an empty set. Um, so this, in most of the case, I don't know if I say in most, but in many cases, this will be empty and then we have a complete characterization. But I do have to say that there are examples where this is non-empty and in fact, it even has a significant measure. So this is something that you will have to see depending on the process that you have, uh, whether you can uh, ignore or not. Okay, so having said that, let me go back to the Ardos Rennie model. So this was the prediction for the infinite population, right? The one we discussed before. So what we can do is now sample network from this um, Graphon or this Ardos Rennie model and run uh, the contagion over these sample networks and see what is the fraction of final adopters as a function of the seed size in the sample networks. And it turns out that if you do that, you see that when the population increases, on average, this is average over many realization of the sample networks. Uh, on average, this will indeed converge to the behavior that was predicted by the infinite population model. So at least for these cases, you know, we have very good prediction of what happens in sample networks just by looking at the infinite population model. Okay, and with that, let me go to the third question, which is uh, maybe the most interesting one is now that we learn all of this, can we actually exploit these analyses in order to propose new ways to define seed sets when we don't have exact network information? Um, and so to be a little bit more precise, what I'm going to define here is the max reach contagion problem for the infinite population as um, this optimization problem where what I'm trying to do is find the best initial seed set given a certain uh, budget, which is kind of the measure of this initial seed set, in order to maximize the measure of the final set of adopter. So here I'm giving a budget of the measure of the initial seed set, and I'm asking, okay, who should I uh, put into this set, set given this budget to maximize final adopters? And now, um, you know, the question will become can we solve this problem efficiently if we have different graph on models? And based on that, what can we then say for? Um, seeding in sample networks. And now, of course, I should say that if your graphon is completely general, this may be a very hard problem to solve, right? So we don't have a solution, at least so far, uh, for like any generic graphon. So what I'm going to discuss are actually two special cases. So the first that I will focus on is the stochastic block model case. So this idea when I have nodes partitioning communities, um, and then I will discuss um, a slightly more complicated model, um, which will allow also for infinite different type of agents. And I'm gonna kind of introduce what can we say in that context. Okay, so let me start with the first case, which is um, Max Rich in stochastic block model. So again, this is our problem. 
And what is our main result in this context is that we can solve this kind of infinite dimensional problem equivalently uh, with a problem that is uh, an optimization problem with k variables, where k is the number of communities. So if I have a stochastic block model with k communities, we can solve this problem or recast this problem as an equivalent optimization problem that only has k variable. Now, what is the advantage is that, of course, typically the number of communities is small. So this is something that I can actually uh, attempt at solving. While instead, for example, if I wanted to do this over the realized network, that would be a problem that has size the number of agents, which is much larger than the number of communities. And to give you a little bit of an intuition of how is that and what is actually the optimization problem that I need to solve, um, really the idea of the proof here is to show that if we focus on uh, contagion over graphons with this stochastic block model structure, we can characterize completely what happens in this infinite population model by looking at finite contagion over an auxiliary network that has as many nodes as twice the number of communities. And really the intuition here is that I'm gonna assign a node to each one of my original communities. And in fact, I'm gonna assign two nodes to each one of my original community, one node that um, represent the part of that community that belong to the seed set, and one node that represents the part that is of that community that is not on the seed set. And so here I'm gonna call CI basically a variable that tells me what fraction of community I am I assigning to the seed set. And of course I need to have that the sum of these should be equal to my original budget to satisfy like my problem. And what we show is that um, contagion in this infinite model can be equivalently obtained by studying contagion on this finite network model, where the important thing is that now the um, arrow, so how are these nodes connected, it's kind of inherited from the connection in the stochastic block model, but it's also weighted by this uh, mass of, of um, agents that we assign to the seed set. And so this is kind of a funny contagion process over finite network because here the seed set is fixed, right? Half of my nodes belong to the seed set. Really what I'm designing is the weight of the links. So this is a different way to maximize contagion, not by deciding who do I put in the seed set, but by deciding how do I design the links? Basically how much weight do I assign to each one of the links given the underlying constraint? And this is a problem again that, I, as I mentioned, as dimension k, because really, what are my optimization variables? They are these CIs that I need to design. And so, if I can solve the optimal um, CIs for this problem, um, then the question is, how can I extrapolate for that from that a policy for the sample network? And the way we suggest to do this is a very simple heuristic. When when you look at any sample network, what you do is you seed n times c i star uh, randomly agent for each community i. And the idea here is that in each community agent should be pretty much the same. Uh, so I just need to pick the right proportion of them and the proportion is given by the solution of this problem. And this is um, to kind of convince you that this is a good procedure. So this is a numerical simulation, I think over a stochastic block model with four or five communities. Um, and what you see in this plot is the performance of different seeding policies in the sample network. So the first one is the graphon policy that I've just discussed. Um, the blue one here is this greedy policy that comes from uh, uh, Kamp Kempe, Clamber, Tyrodos paper. And the last one is just a random policy, say forget about everything, just you know, see that random through the entire network. And what you see for each one of these is as a function of the population size, what is the fraction of final adopters in the sample network? And the uh, solid line is the average, and then the shaded thing is the distribution. And you see that you know, the graph on policies has very good performances because already for uh, small population sizes, I get that everybody adopts. So that's the best case scenario, right? With the same set, I was able to induce full adoption. Uh, well, that is not the case instead for the greedy policy that kind of behaves well at the beginning, but then the performance of these degrades sharply when n increases, and the random policy is even worse in this case than the greedy policy. So really to sum up, what are kind of the advantages of this graphon heuristic that we introduced? First of all, I can actually compute it 
just as a function of the connectivity between the different communities, I don't need to know the realized link for each one of my nodes. And then um, in the second thing is that in order to actually find this policy, I need to solve a problem that has dimension K instead of dimension N, which would be the population size. Okay, and so uh, basically to sum up, basically what we've seen now is how to um, design optimal seeding if I have this stochastic block model structure. Again, the main idea there is to partition agents into different communities and typically a small number of communities. So really what this means is that my agents are homogeneous, except for like, you know, I have uh, as many types as number of communities, but besides that, the agents are homogeneous. Um, the next question that you can ask is, can you use this model or these techniques to kind of predict what will happen in cases that are a little bit more complex than that, where really my infinite population, every agent is different. So it's not that they belong to some types and I have a small number of types, there really is an infinite number of types of agents. Now, of course, in that case, things are a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do in order to get some tractability is to focus on a special type of contagion, uh, which is what we call interval contagion. And so the idea is that in these cases, the set of infected agents can be summarized just with an interval, um, A, B, which is a subset of 0, 1, and this uh, contagion will spread by always remaining an interval. Now, of course, that's not true for all graphon, right? This would be like whether this happens or not is a function of the graphon that I have. So we're going to impose some assumptions such that that is the case. And in particular, I'm going to use actually two assumptions to derive our main result in this area. So the first one is really kind of a rephrasing of what I just said. So the idea of this assumption is that for any set AB, possible start set uh, of adopters, there exists some cutoff iterator alpha and beta such that if I look at the left of A, so if I look at all the labels that are in zero A, these agents will adopt if and only if their label is greater than this alpha. So basically there's gonna be some point in this set from zero to A such that if I'm on the right of that point, I'll adopt. If I'm to the left, I will not adopt. And then similarly for the right part, if I look at all the labels that are to the right of the beep and point, um, there is another cutoff beta such that if I'm to the left of that, I will adopt and otherwise not. And you immediately see why this is the assumption that we need, right? Because what this means is that if this is the initial set of adopter at the next set, I'm still gonna have an interval, which is now gonna be between alpha and beta. And then um, you can go on and say like, now if my new set is this alpha prime beta prime, I can repeat this and I'm gonna have that this is still an interval and so on. So this is what gonna guarantee me that contagion really spreads according to intervals. And once I have this assumption, really kind of the interesting thing to understand is, will this process go on forever such that I kind of cover the entire zero one interval or will it at some point stop? And when does that stop? Well, my threshold is greater or equal than A, right? In that case, it doesn't grow anymore. It just stays there. And so in order to make progress on that question, what we are gonna assume is that there is some monotonicity on how things grow to the left and to the right. So let me start with the left. First, what we're gonna assume is that if I fix my right extreme B, then whether contagion continues or not, is monotone in the left extreme. So basically there's gonna be a, some threshold such that if my left extreme is less than the threshold, then contagion propagates to the left. If it is greater than the threshold, then I don't have enough for contagion to propagate to the left. And then I'm gonna have exactly the same condition for the right. And why did I introduce all this condition? Because what we were able to prove is that if I have these two properties, then contagion is actually really simple. So there are actually only four scenarios of what may happen. So either nothing happens, so contagion doesn't spread, or I have right-only contagion, meaning contagion starts on the right and goes on until one, or contagion is only on the left, meaning it starts on the left and goes on until zero, or I have complete contagion. So from my seed set, everybody gets infected. And now you see that you know, this theorem is very useful if you now wanna try to design the optical seed set because really you only have to account for these four possible scenarios. And so this is kind of to introduce how we design the seed set. Remember in this interval contagion, we also have the assumption that the initial seed set should be an interval. And we also know that the, we have a budget row. 
So really the only thing that we need to design is the left extreme of this interval, which is what I call A0, because then we know that this is an interval, so the, the extreme is gonna be A0 plus rho. Um, and then we can characterize this set A of rho, which is the set of A0 for which complete contagion happens. Um, and this we can characterize based on knowledge of this threshold function that I introduced before. So basically the way you can see this is, um, this condition here, for example, A0 plus rho greater than this threshold here means that right contagions happens until one. And then if that happens, this condition here is gonna guarantee that left contagion happens until zero so that I kind of cover my entire interval. And then this is the other side of it when first is left and then it's right. So basically the short story of all of these is that if this set A rho is non-empty, I found a way to design a seed set that will lead to complete contagion. Now, uh, I'm not done with that because even if this seed is empty, I can still have cases where I only have left contagion or only right contagion, which will not lead to complete contagion. And so in order to understand what is the best seed set to achieve right contagion and what is the best seed set to achieve left contagion, I can define some optimization problems that I can solve. And these are kind of old scatter optimization problems. So this is something that is tractable to solve. And so overall, what I'm gonna have is that the amount of, fun of the measure of the final set that I can obtain for a certain budget row is gonna be one, so complete contagion, if my A row is different than zero, uh, that is not empty, and instead is gonna be uh, otherwise the maximum between what I can achieve with right contagion, with left contagion, or this would be the case where I no contagion, right row is the case, this was the initial seed set. Um, and I know this is a little bit complicated, but um, it is something that you can actually apply. The only thing that these techniques really relies is for you to be able to compute what these threshold functions are. And not, this is of course not super simple in general, but in the paper we have a number of graphons for which we were able to compute what are these threshold functions. And one example of that is the growing uniform attachment model. Um, so what you see here on the left is the graph on that corresponds to the limit of a graph that's grown according to this process. And what is this process is a kind of dynamic way to generate network where uh, every time you add nodes and the nodes that it's coming at time t attaches to all the other nodes with equal probability. And you will see that, you know, the limit of that uh, can be proven to be this type of graph. On. And so what we did was to compute the optimal seed set for this type of graph. On. And then based on that, kind of understand, uh, define an heuristic where we just seed in sample network um, agents that belong to the seed set in the original uh, graphon. Um, and so this is the performance of that. Again, this is our graphon policy defined from optimizing the seed set in the infinite population. This is greedy and this is random. And you see similar behavior as before that you know with graphon policy, we can obtain uh, almost complete contagion. Well, that is not the case for greedy or random policies. Okay, so that leads me to the end of the first part uh, of the talk. And I promise the second part is gonna be much shorter. I think I have 10 minutes at most, even a little bit less on this. I just wanna give you kind of a little bit of a, so, um, of a snapshot of another project that I did that is not for socioeconomic network, but it's um, in the context of physical infrastructure. In this case, this was motivated by the power grid. Um, but still we wanna get kind of network intervention for very large um, networks. And this is some work that I've done with Shriya Nagpal and Lizzie Anderson from Cornell University. Um, and here, what we analyze is actually networks of coupled phase oscillator. And the uh, reason why we look at this is that they are connected to actually power grid. You can show that power grid can be well, um, well described by a network of coupled phase oscillator. I'm gonna kind of put a slide at that at the end. But for now, let's say just more of an abstract level. Let's just say I have a network of this couple phase oscillator. And what do I mean by this is that I have an oscillator, each one has an angle, theta i, and a natural frequency, omega i zero. And what this uh, model describes is how the natural frequency of my oscillator changes um, because of interaction among them. And one way to do that is using the so-called Kuramoto model. And to describe that, maybe the first, the easiest way to do it is to put a picture where I'm actually um, visualizing my oscillator just as points in the unit disk. So what the um, 
position of these points in the disk is going to represent what is the angle. And the, uh, these uh, oscillators are going to kind of um, circulate around the unit disk with an angular velocity, which in isolation just corresponds to the natural frequency. So this would be like the dynamics and uh, an illustration of the dynamics when I have no interaction among the oscillator. So what the Kuramoto does is tell me what happens if I now start coupling this oscillator. And the simplest way to think of it is put a spring between these oscillators in my unit circle. And this is now going to give me some interaction. So like the angular velocity is going to change because of interaction among the oscillator. And in fact, that you can prove depends on the uh, difference of the angle through this sign relation. And now the first thing that you can try to see is that, or convince yourself, is that if I make these strings stronger and stronger, so increase their uh, constants, um, at some point, this is going to behave like a rigid body, right? Like, oh, I will pretty much connect these uh, points such that they will, the only thing that they can do is to all move at the same uh, velocity around this circle. Uh, and so when that happens is we see that synchronicity happens. So like all my oscillator that had their own natural frequency, because of this interaction, they start oscillating all at the same frequency. And this is kind of one of the reasons why this model is so popular, because it can be used to describe synchronous behavior in a number of complex systems, ranging you know, from the human body, behavior of animals, like synchronization of fireflies, and also the power grid, as I mentioned at the beginning. And this model is being really well studied. You know, a large literature focus on properties of this model. For example, a very interesting question that you can ask is, as a function of my connectivity of the weight B that I have among these nodes, when is that synchronicity happens, right? I kind of convince you that if B is large enough, it will happen, but can we be a little bit more specific than that? And in fact, there is work on that. So this is a beautiful paper that shows that, for example, you can find uh, bounds on the uh, connectivity of your network such that synchronicity will happen. Um, a second question that is what we were interested in this work is actually how robust is the synchronicity? Um, and so to specify that, really what do we mean by robust is, is it true that this system will be able to maintain synchronicity if I now slightly perturb the natural frequencies? So to be a little bit more precise, pick a node K in your network and subject is natural frequency to a time dependent small noise. Now, because of that, clearly this is gonna have an effect on my entire system. So the angular velocity of each one of my um, oscillator, I is gonna change because I per perturb node K. So let me call omega I given K, the new angular frequency at time T um, and, and let's omega bar be the average. So what I may be interested in is how out of sync did I end up being because of this perturbation? And that at time t is given by this quantity here. You see, I, I look at for each one of my nodes, how far it is from the new average in expectation, and then I sum this over all my nodes. So this gives me at time t, how much out of sync am I? And then if I wanna quantify a performance for the entire system, I can just take the time average integral of that for the entire horizon. And so that is something that people define as the vulnerability of my node k. Right. All of these started because I perturb node K. So this is going to quantify how out of sync I end up being because I perturb node K. And this in general, you know, it's very complicated quantity to evaluate. Uh, you have to solve this dynamical system. But what was shown in this paper is that under suitable assumption on the noise, this can be related actually to network effective resistances. And this is nice because network effective resistance is something you can compute just based on the topology. You don't need to solve any dynamic equation for that. Um, and in particular, the form is here, let Rij be the effective resistance between node i and j. Then what was shown in this paper is that this vulnerability of node k can be approximated by the sum of resistances from any node of my network to the node k where perturbation happened, minus the average resistances over all the network. And so really the question for our work was, can we use this result to plan intervention? And again, targeted intervention. And what is the type of intervention that we have in mind? What we want to do is change the weights in my network in such a way to increase robustness. So we now are going to define a set of nodes where we expect perturbation to happen. And what we want to do is we want to find the best possible allocation of edge weights to minimize the 
worst case vulnerability over the set of vulnerable nodes. And what I'm kind of going to show you in the last three or four minutes is that this is actually an optimization, a convex optimization problem can be reformulated as a semi-definite program, which allow us to get tractability for large network. And then I'm gonna show you just how do we apply this to a high voltage electric grid. Okay, so the first thing is to prove that this is convex, the cost function is convex. Um, so here I have a worst case over all possible vulnerability nodes. Let me just start with looking at what happens to one node. So let's see what is this measure of vulnerability um, in terms of effective resistance for just one node K. Now it turns out that these you can actually rewrite in terms of the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian of your network. Um, and this is interesting because we know a lot of the Laplacian of networks. So we know that because our network is undirected, this is gonna be symmetric. And we know that, uh, or we actually assume that our network is connected. So that will give us that the Laplacian only has one negative value in zero. And in fact, it gives us an explicit formula to compute the pseudo inverse. And so plugging in this formula in there, we see that basically the quantity that we are trying to optimize over, or we are trying to show it's convex, can be rewritten in this form here, which is some sort of you know, uh, quadratic form where I have my inverse of this matrix in the middle. And the other nice result that we were able to exploit is that if I have a quadratic form of this type, this is convex in the entries of the matrix that I have in the middle. Um, if my matrix is positive definite, um, which is something that we have in our case, because remember the matrix in the middle is the Laplacian that only has one eigenvalue in zero, but adding this term here, we're actually moving that eigenvalue to one. So this is now something that's gonna have all eigenvalue. Um, positive and um, so we, we it's also symmetric because we have an undirected network. And so we know that basically this whole expression is convex in the entries of this matrix that I have in the middle. The final step is to note that the Laplacian matrix is actually an affine function of the edge weight. So combining this, I will have this all this function is convex in the edge weight. And so remember this was just for one of my vulnerability. My measure is the worst case but the max of convex function is convex. So I have that this is um, also a convex function. Now, oh, so this is good, but this is not necessarily given tractability because I can have convex problems that are still hard to solve. But what we were able to show is in fact that this can be reformulated as a semi-definite program and that we have efficient solver to actually um, optimize. Um, and the way we do this is actually quite standard. So we introduce a slack variable T and we wanna minimize that slack variable subject to the constraint that uh, my vulnerability measure should be less or equal than T for all K. So this is equal to maximizing, uh, to minimizing the worst case vulnerability. And then the last thing is using this explicit formula that we have for MK, um, we are able to reformulate this uh, constraint, this inequality constraint that we have here using sure complement into something that can be put as an SDP constraint. And so overall, we now have that of solving this problem is equivalent to solving this problem here where the SK are defined from the sure complement, uh, which is something that's tractable. Um, okay, last thing that I wanted to say is that um, this is gonna guarantee that I'm robust, but it's not gonna guarantee synchronicity per se. So I'm not sure that the new network weights are satisfying condition for uh, synchronicity, but this, you know, we have already a condition for that. This is what I've discussed before. And you can prove this is also an SDP constraint that you can just add on top of your problem. And so to kind of conclude, because I'm running out of time, this is the application of this theory to the high voltage grid. Um, so why can we apply that? Because you can describe the high voltage electric grid as a network of couple oscillator where nodes are um, the uh, phase angle of each one of your load or generator buses and edges are just the transmission line. And using uh, physics, you can evolve, uh, you can derive what are the evolution of this voltage phase angle. And this is known as the swing equation which you will see as a very similar form to the Kuramoto model that we described before. The only problem is that we have these second order terms. But what was shown in this paper here is that the same measure of robustness that we study for the Kuramoto model actually performs really well, even when you have the second order terms. Um, so based on that, really what we wanted to do is can we use the tools that we discussed to derive um, 
some measure of robustness for the power grid. And the most important thing is robustness to what? Well, that was robustness to perturbation of the natural frequencies. And so that corresponds in the power grid to perturbation of the power injected on node I. And so when is that we have this type of perturbation? When well, one case of that is renewable generation, which is subject to fluctuation. So we want to kind of, this would be a way to robustify the grid with respect to fluctuation to renewable energy sources. And so this is um, now just an application of that to the New York region. Um, and you see here the vulnerability measure before our optimization in blue and after our optimization when we redistribute the link in order to increase robustness um, in orange. And you see that we perform on average much better uh, for uh, all the nodes. Okay, so with that, let me conclude. So what we've presented here is basically two uh, case studies of how we can design targeted intervention when we have um, very large networks. So one was contagion in large uh, sample network. And I have to say that I did not touch on that, but we have similar results for network games. So games where agents are not just deciding zero one, whether to adopt or not, but they can actually have a continuum of action. So you would see that in this paper here. And we also wrote a survey on kind of these type of uh, questions in the context of strategic behavior in large networks. And then the second application is this application to the power grid that I just mentioned. Okay, so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thanks Francesca for the very interesting talk. So uh, I think it's uh, <clears throat> maybe it's a good time to open the floor for, for questions from the audience. So please feel free to unmute uh, if you have any questions for Francesca. Maybe I can start with a question. Um, thanks, Francesca, for the talk. So um, regarding your second part, um, your vulnerability measure is basically based on the network, right? <laughs> how does how does it depend to the type of information, the dynamics on the network. For example, if you have dynamics, it would uh, be degree driven, for example, or degree avert, or any type of information that would indicate how the information would spread in your network. How does, is that taken into account in your modeling? Or would that play um, on? So the dynamics in my model are fixed, right? The dynamics are really this Kuramoto model. Um, so these are the dynamics that we are considering. The only thing that I can say is that there is this paper by Tylo et al, where they show that, you know, if you have second order terms and, you know, with a particular structure, actually not in even all cases, then some of these results generalized, uh, but I wouldn't know beyond that. Like, so really that is kind mm -hmm. of tied more to this. And in fact, our contribution was not really to study the vulnerability measure per se, but once we have this expression of vulnerability measure in terms of effective resistances, can we optimize the edge weights? That makes sense. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry, I missed the part that it was, uh, that the dynamics were fixed, yeah, okay. It yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah, so maybe I can also, uh, I also have one here. So I think it's also about the second part here. So. Uh, just curious, like how does the solution actually look like? Like, like does it have some kind of uh, like, like uh, for example, if you fix the network to be some kind of uh, special, like to be some the original network to be some kind of special cases, and then you try to solve uh, the proposed optimization problem, then what kind of weights uh, do you does it or uh, do you get in the return? Yeah. Um... I think we've done some of that. I haven't, I don't have the slides. Like, so kind of look at for some specific example, like what this weight will look like. Um, yeah. I think maybe a little bit of intuition comes from here. So like from what is the vulnerability measure of a node? Like that's the sum of kind of these effective resistances uh, from node J to node K. And this you can think of it as an expected commute time. Like how long it takes for a random worker to go from any node in your network to this node K. So you, in order to kind of keep this small, you would like for that to be small, as small as possible. Uh, but then you also have these other terms that is the average of the effective resistance in all the networks. So you also have this kind of balancing effect uh, of mm -hmm. these two things. 
Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm no, I'm this is not super yeah. precise. We do have something in the paper uh, for yeah. some specific network, but in general, I think it's still mm. you need to solve uh-huh. it. And also, I guess the set V prime here, which which is basically where where your mean mass uh, objective functions is trying to do also also plays a role here. Yeah, yeah, so no. This also, the balance is The intuition we have is when you optimize just for one node. So if mm-hmm. you're saying I just want to optimize the weights for uh, minimizing vulnerability at this particular node, if you start having more than one node, I think it's even more complicated to get an intuition of how these will mm-hmm. interact all one with each other. Then you really need to solve the optimization problem. I see. Thanks. So uh, is there other questions for Francesca? Well, actually I have one more. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So actually, so this time actually I have a question about the first part. Mm -hmm. So, So my understanding is that the first part talks about how do we uh, how do we make interventions uh, on on the graph or models with this of basically like something like a voters model. You know, you, you have this kind of adoption adoption uh, strategies. So, but uh, one question that I have in mind is so, for my understanding is that like having a graph or model somehow somehow restricts ourselves to have to have some kind of symmetric graph. Mm, I mean, you can have also graphons that uh, are not symmetric and they will generate oh. uh, graphs that are not. Um, so I, I think of our result, I mean, the one I presented here, yes, is for the symmetric case, but I think they could be all generalized also to undirected graph. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, one thing that I should say is that graphs that you can describe with these are dense uh, graphs. So this is another thing where people ask me in general, you know, you will not be able to obtain some very sparse structure with this type mm. of result. So the, the best that you can yeah. do, I think, is to have mm. something where the number of nodes grows logarithmically with the number of agents in your network. Mm. But you need to have that type of accumulation because we need to use this concentration inequality. Um, and in order mm. for that to kind of concentrate, you need to have enough number of neighbors. So I think that that is yeah, yeah, yeah. something that happens oh, yes. in this particular mm. model. But yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, do we have any more questions for Francesca? So, if none, I guess uh, maybe we can call it a day. I mean, for me. Perfect. <laughs>